No. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. I yeah, appreciate that. All right, I'm glad to be able to stand before you for this uh, second negative speech. I want to thank again my opponent for being gracious and everyone here at Olson Park being so kind. I had uh, failed to answer the questions in my first speech, so let me go ahead and answer his questions. When was the first coming of Jesus? Well, there are many uh, comings in the sense of Christophanies, but there was only one flesh uh, and blood coming under the law of Moses took place when Mary gave birth. And there's only one second coming. And in my affirmative, I will affirm that when they had a reference to Jesus coming, it was only one second coming. And once you have a time indicator given to the text, every time the event is mentioned, it's guided by the same time indicator. Now, the coming of the Lord was at hand in the first century. And that phrase never, ever ever in Scripture goes beyond a 40-year period. Never. And I'll approve that in my first affirmative on Thursday night, if you stay with me. Question number two. What New Testament passage supports the teaching of eternal conscious punishment of the wicked in hell after AD 70? None. I don't mind telling you that. And this is what I believe. Because of the corporate nature of the punishment, in Luke 17, 37, where the body is, there will be the eagles be gathered together. Now my opponent believes that's an end of time event. But Matthew 24 28 before the alleged divide says the same thing. With the carcasses there will the eagles gather together. He's got to say these are two different subjects. They are not. Consumed at the time of the end. It's Hebrew judgment language. He's using the language of the prophets. Isaiah 10 verse 18. Open your Bible sometime. Read Isaiah 10 Soul and body consume, few are left. And again, my opponent says, the righteous will be taken at the end of time. No, no. The Bible speaks about Noah being left. He was spared. The uh, old world was taken. To left means spared in every passage in the Old Testament. He can't find one to save his life, but he comes to the New Testament. He thinks these are new ideas. He doesn't know the voices of the prophets. That's why he misreads the text. That's why we have misread the text, because we haven't known the voices of the prophets. Was the physical death and personal body resurrection sufficient for our atonement? No. He needs a covenant. Now, do you have to be baptized for the remission of sins or not? Do you have to be baptized for the remission of sins? You can just, you can just, yes. So it must be that there is some kind of response to the gospel, a death and a burial and a resurrection. Now, for 40 years they had a ceiling. When Peter says on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that gift was miraculous in nature. It was the gift and the promise of the Holy Spirit coming upon last days Israel. Not our last days, their last days. For 40 years, the Holy Spirit was given as a ceiling, as a promise and a guarantee. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 22 and 23, we find that the ceiling and the guarantee and the anointing referred to the Holy Spirit working. Now the anointing is miraculous in Acts 10 verse 38. It's miraculous in 1 John 2 26. For no one need teach you, you have the anointing. The sealing is the miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit given by the impartation of the apostles' hands. That's what it is. And it was promised for 40 years. The Old Testament has several uh, prophecies about this. Zechariah 13, 14, Micah chapter 7, Daniel 9, 24. The prophetic office would end in the face-to-face -face meeting of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 13. And so, then it's not a miraculous transformation at the end of time. It's a spiritual transformation at the time of the end. How would you prove Psalm 16 is a prophecy of the bodily resurrection of Jesus? Listen. In Matthew 12 and verse 40, the bodily resurrection, physical part, was a sign. Okay? A sign is a symbol of a greater reality. Jesus died for our sins. When you sin, you die. That's the appointment, not physical death. It's appointed for men once to die. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's your appointment. And Jesus meant the appointment because He died in spirit. 
And so when he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the only time in Scripture where God addressed, Jesus addressed God without calling him the Father. Because he was giving up relationship with a father that he might establish sons. So on the cross for the three hours of darkness, it was a demonstration that he was separated from his father. Then he goes to Hades as a result of having um, died while under the law. And then he will overcome the Hadean world and he would be the first man in the new covenant. Now, according to my opponent in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 42, he says, well, that's the physical body sown in corruption. Well, Jesus didn't know any corruption. He should have been sown corruption for 33 years. So that's an abject contradiction. I've demonstrated the casuistry of the argumentation of my opponent because he has Jesus being sown in corruption for 33 years. No, that's not correct. Corruption is the concept of corruption in a body. And the ancients spoke about a body. It was sown in corruption. The old covenant body. The Jews said, oh no, the law will remain. Our old covenant body will remain. Oh no, 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 no. It had to die. And it was being raised, present tense verb, in incorruption. It's simply a process of being bring to life. And it took place at the end, just like Daniel chapter 12. Brother Bruce, no New Testament writer is at liberty to take an Old Testament text out of context. It was spoken in a particular context. Sometimes there's a type. But Ephraim offended in Baal, Hosea 13, 1, and he died. So the covenant people, the northern tribes, they sinned and they died. One day, through a three-day resurrection, they would live again, ransomed from the grave. Now he says, well, they were redeemed. They were redeemed. They had the forgiveness of sins. Forgive me, I get by too forgive. My wife told me not to do that, okay? That's just my nature. I get a little excited. You're a good guy. Love you guys. Very reasonable. All right, they're redeemed. They have the forgiveness of sins. Then why, Brother Bruce, was not heaven open for them? If you are redeemed, what does that mean for you? It means the forgiveness of sins, you see. That's the only thing that keeps you out of God's presence, which I believe I'm in today. I believe if I live and by believe in Him, I will never die. Because death for me as a Christian is overcome. The old covenant world is overcome, and I will never die. And I will live sequentially. And so when my physical life is over, I will continue to live. On and on and on, and so will every faithful Christian. And that is our hope, and there's one hope, and there's an eternal life. That is the idea of what the text is getting at. Now, if he says they have redemption, why isn't heaven opened? Do you realize that the Bible teaches that heaven was opened at the fall of the temple? You got your Bibles? Open your Bible to Revelation chapter 11 for a moment. The book of Revelation is about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. This concept that it was written in 96 AD came from a Catholic uh, scholar by the name of Caesar Baronius. That's where it came from. The Bible teaches miracles for 40 years. It had to have been written before the fall of the temple. Now, it was at hand in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. It was at hand in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 10. They were shortly to come to pass in Revelation 1, 1, shortly to come to pass in Revelation 22 and verse 6. That's an inclusio argument. That means everything within its contents were about to take place. Everything. Well, in Revelation chapter 11, let's see what happens here in verse 8. Their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, what city was Jesus crucified in? There's only one city he was crucified in, and that is Jerusalem. Now, notice what happens, please, in verse 12. This city falls. Then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. These are the two witnesses. My position is this is Peter and Paul. There are the witnesses. I don't believe that Paul died at Rome by Roman Catholic tradition. If you'll check the epistles, he's making his way back to Jerusalem and filling up the measure. Jesus said that it is not possible that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. And they were filling up the measure. And all the righteous blood said from the foundation of the world, from righteous Abel to Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar, would come upon this generation. And then that day of atonement would come, when the righteous saint would have their vengeance. And they were going to have it in a little while. Now notice, this is the seventh angel sounding, verse 15. That's the last trump. If Paul's trump is a different trump, then it's the eighth trump, and that's the first in Hebraic counting. This is the last trump. What happens? Jerusalem, 
the city where Jesus was crucified. It falls. Babylon falls. Babylon the Great is Jerusalem. Come up hither. The last trump. Dead saints out of Hades. You see, in Hebrews 12 and verse 9, He will now bring us to the heavenly Jerusalem where the spirits of just men are made perfect. Your physical, biological body at this particular point does not harbor sin. It does not harbor sin. There's nothing wrong with your flesh and blood. It doesn't need to be transformed. But you need to get into an incorruptible body. Now, what is the one body? It's the church. question is, when did the kingdom, when was it consummated? Now, you remember in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, in the days of these kings, God would establish an everlasting kingdom that would never be destroyed. Well, Babylon and the Median Persian and the Grecian and the Roman, they occupied a land base. That land base would be occupied when the kingdom of God would arrive on the earth. That didn't take place at Pentecost. So this gospel would be preached to all the world for a witness, and then the end will come. The same end that Peter said was at hand. The same end that he speaks about a body being transformed. Let me give you a parallel passage. Romans 8, verse 10. The body is dead because of sin. This is the old covenant body that died due to sin. Now the Spirit is sent into that body for the last day's transformation. And He would raise up their mortal bodies. Those are Jew-Gentile distinctions which were coming to an end. They were looking for the glory which was about to be revealed. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 23, they were looking for the redemption of our body. It was simply the process. It's not a different nature. Because in Romans chapter 9 and verse 4, the redemption belongs to Israel. So Israel dies. Holy Spirit's given for the last days, bringing it back to life. So when is the kingdom established? The kingdom is consummated. Jesus said that the kingdom, and Jesus only spoke about the kingdom with one particular event. All the other scriptures had to do with that hand, and some of you will not taste of death. If he meant by that, most of you will taste death. Some of you will not taste of death until the kingdom comes. He's making a 40-year prediction. And Jesus says in Luke 21, 31, when you see these things come to pass, know the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Now, I know what you've taught. You've taught that Mark 9, 1 is Pentecost. It means no such thing. And Mark 8, 38 and Mark 9, 1 belong together. The coming in the glory, the coming in judgment, and the kingdom are together. What did Jesus say in Luke 21, 27? Then you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Then your redemption draws nigh. If that coming is spiritual, then the redemption is spiritual. And in verse 31, that kingdom is spiritual. In, Luke, in Revelation chapter 12, 10, then comes uh, salvation, strength, and the kingdom. That's the second coming of Christ. It was a spiritual idea. The Jews missed Jesus in his first coming because they were looking for someone to rule over their enemies in a physical way. My opponent and my uh, friends at this table miss the second coming of Jesus for the same reason. They're looking for physical Fleshly promises, and they are not. Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 15 are parallel texts, and those promises belong to Israel. Now, he believes that redemption, redemption, again, he said, was complete. Why can't you go to heaven? Please answer why you can't go to heaven. See, I believe in the proleptical approach. The sealing is the guarantee. You know what the word guarantee means in the original language? It means they used it for a... Uh, engagement ring. It's a seal, a pledge. The Holy Spirit was the guarantee that the full payment of the same amount uh, or the same kind of payment would be completed. The redemption of our body. Not your, your physical body doesn't need to be redeemed. They were being redeemed in a body. That's true. And I believe in a bodily resurrection. When uh, Paul says, and he's talking about his opponents, and they are Judaizers, what body do they come? Plural pronoun, singular subject. And Paul has to tell them that that old covenant body was being sown in corruption. And the law will have to come to an end. And then he talks about this future present idea. And then you make fun of the prolepsis that I'm making. So he makes up a definition for a term in order to de 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 decry or, or de to tell about the strength of sin as the law. Listen. 
the strength of sin is the law of Moses. And that came to an end at the fall of the temple by means of the cross, but certainly not at the cross. And Paul participating with animal sacrifices in Acts 21, 23, 26 is absolute proof that the law continued. The law is like a civil law, by the way. All right? It can condemn you, just can't save anyone. Just still had to keep it. Suppose you, suppose you got a young man, 18 years old, he goes through a, uh, a school zone 100 miles an hour. He sins, doesn't he? Sure he does. Suppose he obeys the gospel. Well, okay, now he's justified. Now, can he continue, can he continue to speed? No, he's got to obey his civil laws too, and civil law changes from, from nation to nation. That's the way the law operated for the Jews. It could condemn them, just couldn't save anybody. That's why he participates with the animal sacrifices in Acts 21. It's the only logical reason. It's the only way it could possibly work. Because Paul was living in all good conscience before God until that day, Acts 23 verse 1, and he wrote the book of Romans before he goes into Jerusalem, proven by Romans 15 31. And I'm going too fast. All right. So in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, Paul is speaking about the transition of the covenants. He's denying the words of the Judaizers. He is quoting from Hosea 6 verse 2 because it's the only text in the Old Testament where there's a prediction of resurrection on the third day. Brother Reeves, if he's not quoting from Hosea 6, you find the scripture. And he is talking about the Old Testament. He's arguing from a codified whole of the Old Testament according to the Scriptures. And so Israel would be saved by a three-day resurrection. If you deny the resurrection of the dead ones, by implication you deny the resurrection of Christ. But they weren't denying the resurrection of Christ. But you see, if they said the dead ones won't come out of Hades, then he didn't come out of Hades, but he came out of Hades. Therefore, they'll come out of Hades and the law will end. Now, that's the argument that he's making, Brother Bruce. And because you've been reading these commentaries, and I know full well how you study. Brother, I love you. I did the same thing. I taught at Tennessee Bible College. That's, oh, it's a Greek idea here. This is the problem with the Greeks. No, the issues are Jewish in the first century. And they're Jew-Gentile issues, which are manifest in the New Testament. And I know it's so. And so the last trump is the seventh trump of the book of Revelation. Now that's fulfilled. Therefore, the last trump of the book of 1 Corinthians has to be fulfilled as well. And it does not mean once saved, always saved. It doesn't mean that at all. So, in Adam we all die. How did Adam die? He sinned and he died. How do we live? We obey and we live. The text doesn't have to put all the details together to mean that very thing, and that's what it means. I don't believe in once saved, always saved. I believe if you live and believe in Christ, you will never die. And I don't think you go to Hades where the Old Testament saints went, and they got in there with the blood of goats and animals, and then he says somehow, I take away redemption? I took away their salvation? He puts you, if you die, he puts you in Hades. Now that's nigh... Oh, uh, that's wrong. That's wrong-headed to believe that the covenant, the full covenant of Jesus Christ puts you in the same place that the Old Testament saints go. Listen, I am resurrected in Christ. I am living in Christ. And when you obey the gospel, you die, you bury, you're raised again. Now that's a spiritual idea, is it not? They had the gift of the Spirit, which is the promise that baptism would bring forward its true purpose. And today, this side of the temple, the seven ones are still operating. And there might be some guys who deny that, but I certainly would not. And I believe that baptism doesn't need a gift because it has its complete purpose today. And when someone is buried with Christ, having repented of sins, he's raised in newness of life today he is in God's presence, and he will never die. If this is biological, physical death, then the last enemy is physical, biological death. I don't think that's an enemy. Do you really teach that it's an enemy? When in fact, in Job chapter 3 and verse 21, some would long for death. I had a good friend. I baptized a Catholic lady. She was 90 years old, and she died at 103. And she longed to leave. She'd grown feeble and weak. She had a sharp mind. 
<laughs> I'll never preach another soul into Hades. Never ever again. Because Hades was destroyed at the last trump. The book of Revelation teaches it. So Revelation chapter 14, 13. Blessed are the dead which die from now on. Henceforth, Babylon is fallen. Resurrection takes place. Revelation eleven nineteen 19. At the temple falling. The dead are judged and the temple of God is opened in heaven. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 5. He says uh, the same picture is repeated again. He says, I looked at these things and the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of heaven was opened. Revelation chapter 15 verse 8. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to uh, enter the temple to the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. That book of Revelation is completed. And I believe when the last stone of that temple was pried loose, the end came, the trumpet was sounded, the gathering took place, the resurrection took place, and the covenant was completed. And I believe that with all of my heart. And no, I do not believe that Jesus was coming back in a physical body because He left in a physical body. Did Jesus have wounds in His resurrected body? Did he have wounds in his physical body? So if he has to come back in that very way, then he comes back with wounds. No. You see, he was begotten again in his resurrection. He was the first man on the inside who was in the new covenant. He had overcome the world. He's the first fruits. A lot of individuals had been resurrected from the biological dead. There are seven biological resurrections. He's the first fruits. He's the only one that overcame the Hadean world, you see. And so there's a, a, a huge difference in that. Now, death and life. In Hebraic thought, if you're out of the Father's presence, you're dead. Remember about the, the prodigal? So the prodigal in Luke 15, 24, the Father says, My son was dead. He's alive again. He came back to the Father's house. And the house is the church. And it was completed as the kingdom is completed. You see, I believe that the body is the church. And the church is the kingdom. And I believe that in fact, the church is completed over a 40 year period. And that's when sins were forgiven. How much time do I have? Ten minutes. So let's open our Bibles tonight, shall we? To Romans chapter 11. And we're going to find out when God says the remission of sins was given. And when remission of sins was promised through the sealing of the Spirit was the guarantee that it would come. So let's see what the Bible says here in Romans 11, 25 through 27. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In Luke 21 and 24, the fullness of the Gentiles is that last three and a half year period where they punished the Jews. That's where, where it was. Now notice what he says. And so all Israel will be saved. That is, as the Gentiles, they will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That was their future. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 27. And he's quoting in context. He's not making up some new meaning. He is quoting in context. Please notice Isaiah chapter 27, please. And we'll see when the fruit of taking away his sin will finally be uh, accepted. So in Isaiah chapter 27, the Bible says, Therefore, by this the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is all the fruit of, of, of taking away his sin. When he makes the stones of the altar like chalk stones, that are beaten to dust, wooden and images, and incense altars shall not stand. Yet the fortified city will be desolate. Now ask yourself the question, what's the fortified city? And when will the fortified city be desolate? Because he doesn't know the voice of the prophets. He thinks Paul is making out new context out of Old Testament texts, and they are meaning no such thing. A New Testament author always quotes in context, and he's referencing Isaiah 24 through 28, which refers to the destruction of the temple. And in the destruction of the temple, the resurrection took place. Now just open your Bibles now. Get your Bibles. Get your Bibles at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 31. And we're going to read these verses together. 
All right? Everyone that I know in the church believes that Matthew 24, 31 took place by the time that the temple fell. The book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians are written in 51 and 52 A.D. Now please notice what Jesus said. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Okay? These are the angels. This is the gathering at the end of the age. Matthew 13. He will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's a pretty big gathering. From one end of heaven to the other, the gathering would take place. That's the last trump. In the twinkling of an eye, Hades has vanished. The temple falls. And that's why they were interested all over the empire about the temple falling. Because they knew that their resurrection promises would be fulfilled then. And from that point onward, spiritual death for the covenant people is destroyed. The last enemy is death. Christians, you don't... Biological death's not your enemy. It's not your enemy. It's your friend sometimes. And so if somebody is in Christ, he will live and he will believe in, in him, he will live and, and never die, Jesus said. So now look at 2 Thessalonians 2 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, he's talking about the same gathering. What gathering is it? It's resurrection. When's it going to take place? It's going to take a place when this individual who is sitting in the temple, who's showing himself that he is God, and he's going to be destroyed with this flaming fire. It's the same language of the prophets. It's Isaiah 66, 15 and 16. He's coming with flaming fire, with chariots. It's Hebrew hyperbole is what it is. Because there's a man sitting in the temple causing the persecution. Five minutes? Well, let me go on just for a moment. Who's this man sitting in the temple? Because when that man sitting in the temple is destroyed, resurrection and gathering takes place. You know what our brethren have taught? That's the Pope. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just ridiculous. Revelation 13, 18, it's the 666 man. The sea beast is Rome. The land beast is Judaism. Six is a temple number. Some years ago, two, three years ago now, maybe four years ago now, I decide the 666, Neron, Caesar, Wallace said, you know, I said, how would you know this unless you knew history? I said, I'll bet. I'll, I'll, I'll guess. I'm not a betting mind. I, I'm, I'm using this hyperbole. I'll guess that that number's in the Old Testament. I could figure it out in the Old Testament. So one morning I got in my office, stayed in my office all day, and I looked up 660 and 666, and I found something pretty extraordinary. That 666 talents of gold is the temple land tax, 1 Kings 10.4. That the priests live in six by six compartments. That in fact, there are 60 pillars in the temple. That there are these walls that are 18 cubits high, 666. Six, six. I can go on and on. It's a temple number. If you're a Jew in the first century, you're thinking, man, sitting in the temple, he's the high priest. What did Jesus say? You will see the Son of Man coming at the right hand of power. He's using national judgment language, just like Isaiah used in Isaiah 19.1. The Lord rides on a swift cloud. It was, but he came through Sargon of Assyria, Isaiah chapter 20. And so that's the last trump. This all fits together. Resurrection takes place at the time of the end, but not the end of time. There's one end, and the end of all things was at hand. My futurist folk over here, and they're good guys. I know they're, they're good in, in many ways. They got more ends than old McDonald. Here an end, there an end, everywhere an end, end. Well, here's the end of the Jewish system. Here's the end of somehow gospel evangelism in the first century. No. There's one end. Spiritual gifts to the end. Again, let's look at 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8. Same thing. It's the same thing. Miracles for 40 years. The Old Testament teaches that in at least three passages. Probably more that I haven't discovered yet. So in 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8, either Jesus returned or you've got spiritual gifts. And if you've have ever met any Pentecostal who knows his doctrine, he's going right to this text. 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the coming. 
That's the apocalypse, okay? That's the revealing of Christ, who will also confirm you to the end. Now, that's not the gifts I debated the man who said he confirmed them. Oh, so that's one saved, always saved them. He's confirming them with the gifts unto the coming of the Lord. What happens in Joshua chapter 5? 40 year transition. The manna ceases. Who does Joshua meet? He meets the man with the outstretched sword. Josh, he's told, he tells Joshua, take the shoes off your feet for the place that you stand is holy. He met Jesus. That's the type. 1 Corinthians 10. Miracles for 40 years. Meeting the Lord. Then the end comes. And there's one great end. Not different ends in different contexts. There's one great end. Paul speaks about this end. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, he writes a letter. It's the same end. Then in 1 Corinthians... One minute. Thank you. Then in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, look what he says here. And this is what I wrote my book about. So he says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let, uh, let him be anathema. Aramaic expression, maranatha. That is a quotation from the Syriac, the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, and he was coming quickly to his temple. Why did that affect the church at Corinth? Because the Jewish persecution was rife. All the Jewish leaders went to that last Passover feast where all the bullies on the block were, and Jesus destroyed every single one of them. And when he did, he opened heaven and Hades was overcome and the law ended and now I live in an everlasting kingdom which is an everlasting body and if that kingdom can't be destroyed then the imperishable body is with me. The body, I believe the body is the church. The body is the kingdom. The kingdom is the body. And the body are those who are redeemed in Christ. It is a covenant body at the time of the end that was transformed, not a physical fleshly body at some time in your future. And so the coming of the Lord was at hand then at that particular time. And they overcame the death that was simply reigning through the law. And the law was overcome by the gospel. And the gospel was finally inaugurated when the kingdom came. And the kingdom came. Luke 21, 31. The only time where Jesus spoke about the kingdom with a specific event. So let Jesus have first place in your eschatology. Allow Jesus to be your interpreter. And you can see the reality of these things. And I think that's about time. Well, we've had a great night. It's been a good study. We've dug deep, and we certainly want to thank you for your presence here. In just a moment, we're going to ask one of our deacons, Brother Trevor Yance, to lead us in our closing prayer. Please remember, we're just getting started. Uh, if you are not able to be with us for any others, there's a significant portion of this study you're going to miss. By the same token, if you can only be here Thursday or Friday, you probably need to go back and listen to our first study. So remember, uh, tomorrow night, Lord willing, at 7 o'clock. Thank you.